so this afternoon, as we get a little sleepy after lunch, Sherry and I have the pleasure of sharing with you a couple of things that we're up to, um, kind of different projects that we're doing. So this next project we want to share with you is what we're calling Association 4.0. And um, we assembled a think tank made up of a dozen uh, association leaders and CEOs and, and, and CXOs. And they've been pondering different questions about all the disruption out there that Tom has uh, shared with us um, and what these technologies are doing. Um, you know, how do we retain and attract uh, and increase our membership? You know, still the same words, those buzzwords of non-dues revenue keeps coming up. Who are really our members now? Uh, different models, uh, the different competition coming up. Um, so Sherry reached out to, like I said, a bunch of folks, and we're really uh, happy that they were able to help us with this think tank. Uh, a lot of them are in the room uh, right now. And we also had a facilitated conversation back in August led by, by Sharon Rice, and it was really great. And the whole premise of this association um, 4.0 is about this new, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so there's been you know, three before that you know, with the steam engines and the computers and things like that. But this next one is happening right now. Uh, but that's when robotics and 3D printing and analytics and artificial intelligence, we don't look at them as individual anymore, but we've got to look at them as the integration of all those into some ultimate solution. And really what that's doing, it's blurring the lines between the physical, virtual, and biological worlds. And it's coming at us so fast that when we blink, it's gonna, we're going to miss it. And some of us might be swept away. Some of our organization won't even be around, or they'll be very different than what they are today. Um, so there's new marketing uh, models. Uh, there's new uh, revenue models. And there's very different expectations that are happening. Uh, and like Tom said, it'll impact every industry on the planet. Um, and it's going to happen very, very fast. Uh, just like you know, years ago when you saw your, your neighbors or colleagues that had a, you know, this thing called an iPhone, and then now who doesn't have a smartphone, right? So it's going to be very, very fast. And we've already seen the beginnings of this. There's products out there today. You know, some of us might have something called Nest, which is you know, a self-learning thermostat. You don't need to program it anymore where you have to go in and say, you know, up at 72 at 7 a.m. It just knows your habits when you're there, when you're not there, and it knows the temperature inside and outside. So this is you know, a small example. Uh, the medical uh, industry is also leading the way with all this simulation, combining an LMS, simulation, robotics, data analytics to really improve outcomes for, for patients, uh, which is a good thing for all of us since we're all patients. And um, you know, just different things like that are all com coming together. So I just right now want to share with you um, a short video on the uh, fourth industrial revolution. The original industrial revolution was driven by the discovery that you could use steam engines to do all kinds of interesting things. That was followed by additional revolutions for electricity and computers and communications technology. We're now in the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution, which is bringing together digital, physical, and biological systems. the features of this fourth industrial revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. We need a different economic model that will allow us to meet the basic needs of every human on the planet, and that will be focused not on growth per se, but on maximizing human well-being. We have energy technologies that can power our civilization, but how do we get it and implement it at the scale we need at a price that people around the world can afford? If we're able to do something to transform things, to make it more efficient, then the impact can be huge. We can use asset tracking, we can use IT, we can use 3D printing to decouple growth from the resource constraints we have. The question of adding quality to quantity, it's really about a diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, clean water, clean energy. Together we're fighting to preserve our fragile climate from irreversible damage and devastation of unthinkable proportions. 
the prediction of 5 million jobs lost by 2020 to technology is serious, but the main question is how can we define work? How can we share the wealth? How can you have a doctor that really knows a lot about data? How can you have a biologist that knows about medicine? We have to create a space that enables people to think freely, to think divergent thoughts, to think creative thoughts. We really need new education. We're working with a World in Motion and FIRST Robotics trying to encourage the students from third grade all the way up through the end of high school to pursue science, math, and different technologies. This ability of digital technology to change outcomes, to truly empower people that can create a more equitable growth. Fourth Industrial Revolution has the potential to make inequalities visible and to make them less acceptable in the future. I was the first person in the world to be able to voluntarily move my legs while stepping in a robot. The cure will be possible if enough of the right people have the will to make it happen. We're seeing this incredibly exciting convergence of genome editing, DNA sequencing. Governments have a very important role to play in enabling the safe and effective use of technology. We need to take responsibility at every level of society to adapt to these technological challenges which are redefining what it means to be completely embedded in this world. Even though we have everyday problems, we have to solve, we have to find a way to lay the foundations for the innovation of tomorrow. Um, so, I'll move on a little bit, but a couple other points on that video was the whole quantity versus quality or versus customization. So, we're used to either having a lot of it or it's really good or it's my way. So, the fourth, and just remember, was saying, in association for us, saying, you can have all three. Mass, produce, highly quality, and customizable. Uh, so I think that's something as vendors and technologies out there, you know, those three things are no longer, you know, you must pick one or the other. It's, it's going to be a given that they want all three and then some. Um, so one of the things, um, uh, as you can see up here, so, you know, the ex there's changing expectations for um, our folks. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, like I said, the, the cell phone usage has, uh, you know, two billion smartphone people out there. Um, and, and one of the things I wanted to uh, mention was, you know, you know, as you're seeing in this video, the Industrial Revolution 4.0 or Association 4.0 is totally going to change the way we, we live and work and create all these different opportunities and threats for, for, for everyone. Um, you know, that blending of the physical and virtual worlds, well, Pokemon Go is a perfect example of that. So there's me playing Pokemon Go last week at, <laughs> at a conference at uh, Chess Physician. So, Ron, it so wasn't billable this, time. It was all good. This is Ron right up here. Um, and, you know, I was getting some points. I'm trying to get to that, you know, 4% tier. Um, so, so anyway, I only bring that up is because it's a perfect example of that blending of those virtual and physical worlds, and we're seeing that. And to have you know a game like Pokemon Go get 25 plus million users in a matter of weeks is, is amazing. And I think we're going to see more and more and more um, of that um, going on. And the other thing, you know, you know Sherry's daughter behind me, I mean, she's wearing, you know, this right here. And you guys need to check this out, you know, at the reception or, or later on. But, I mean, this is what all the kids are going to be learning and playing games is, is, you know, my physical and virtual worlds are going to be combining to one. And then there's other products out there in the simulation world for, um, whoops, um, combining the biological and physical worlds as well. Sorry. The other thing is we need to consider, you know, um, the integration or, you know, we used to call it the work-life balance. Well... <coughs> That's not going to exist anymore. It's really an integration of the two, as we've seen with the physical and virtual and biological worlds. Um, so up here, you know, on, on the left-hand side, you know, you know, that's that's my grandson, and he is playing with my my watch and reading my email. Now he can't read yet. You know, he can sign and he can do other things with with his parents, but you know, 
the expectation is he, he and, and Sarah, who we saw previously, they're all growing up on the web with technology. So their expectations can be very different than having access to my email on my phone. I mean, certainly, you know, on this little device, you know, he is figuring out, oh, I can do something here. So wearable technology um, is going to be out there. And so one of the, the, the main point about this is as your organizations go through this change, and if you're writing down what's the one thing I need to do, well, maybe one of the things you consider is uh, given your staff, your employees, your members, a superior interface, or, because a poor interface to technology really tells your employees that their time and commitment have little value. And then what that translates into is uh, they're not going to innovate for you. And then you wonder why, how come I don't have a culture of innovation? Well, because you gave them such a crappy interface to do their jobs, you're not respecting their time and commitment. So in return, they're not giving you that, that innovation or that culture of innovation you're looking for. So if you're going through your budgeting process, you know, having that extreme uh, user interface, very friendly, is going to be very important, not only for your staff, but, but, but for your members. And you know, I talked about wearable technology. So you know, Snapchat, or I guess now they're called Snap Inc. Um, you know, just released the um, Snapchat um, spectacles just earlier this week. So again, people with glad. I mean, we're going to be seeing people, you know, being driven in autonomous cars, wearing these goggles, <laughs> communicating with their friends. All they have to do is nod, say, take a picture. No one's going to text anymore. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, my kids don't text or email. They Snapchat it or they play a video. Um, or they do something else. Uh, but Snapchat's a very interesting company. So right now, as of last week, they had a close to a 16 billion, that's a billion dollar valuation. Um, they share about uh, 10 billion videos per day. So that's huge. And that number is only gonna increase because I gave uh, a talk at uh, the Alliance CME uh, over the spring and that number was like at seven or eight billion. So just in a few months, it jumped. Um, but this is an amazing company. They have, you know, 110 million users, um, and they've had 50% growth. They are growing four times faster than Twitter and any other uh, company out there. And to have such a, you know, valuation at 16 plus billion dollars is huge. So th that's that, you know, competition being created all around us. You know, bring to my putting the next point here. You know, we're seeing. Um, Entrepreneurs pop up everywhere. So how many here, when they, after they graduated or where they're in school, says, I want to grow up and be a YouTuber? <laughs> right? No, but, but who's hearing that? Sherry's hearing that just this week. And Sandy's kids are saying, I want to be a YouTuber. So they're buying their cameras or GoPros or whatever because they're going to put on a channel because... You know, they know these famous YouTubers out there like, like P.D. Pugh and, and um, uh, whoever else is out there, Justin Bieber PewDiePie. and uh, PewDiePie. Sorry, I don't even know. I'm not a YouTuber. Uh, you know, Jenner Marbles and Prank vs. Prank and, you know, Fine Brothers. So, you know, these are famous millionaire entrepreneurs. And what are they doing? They're videotaping themselves. So I hope someone's videotaping me because I want to be a YouTuber. Um, so anyway, there's different expectations, you know. Those kids out there, they're going to expect to somehow pay their membership renewal dues through Snapchat or a picture or something or something on their phone. They're not going to go log on to your website and go through all of these different steps to prostitute. They're going to want something they can just say yes or send a picture or a smiley face to, and they, they process their, their dues. So also what we're seeing is a transformation in different economies. So years ago, people talked about the experience economy. Right, you know, usable websites, and then we talked about the knowledgeable, you know, economy. All these data flying out there. Now we're seeing the sharing economy, right? Share, uh, Airbnb, Uber, that's here today. So, what's that next economy? Right? It can't be the machine economy, but it really has to be the human economy. It's got to go back to that, and that's what the essence of that video is. It, it this industrial revolution, the survival. People are going to thrive. Is going to make sure that you have that human interface and that uh, put humans back in the center of things. Uh, 
Um, so anyway, you know, as Tom mentioned, so we've seen a lot of this already in the banking industry. For example, who still uh, banks at Wells Fargo? <laughs> right? Nobody. Because, <laughs> oh, sorry. I've been really busy there with this does, conference. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, you know, this is an example of brand trust. I mean, it, it, on, overnight, it was just wiped out. And the other thing is the organization that has such layers of process and governance, you know, like a big bank, like a Wells Fargo, I mean, they didn't even know that person was doing this scam, if you will, of just signing up everyone for a bank account and awarding their staff with bonuses for all these accounts they created because they, they didn't have that transparency because of all the layers of governance and processing. But you need to change that because technology is going to change that for you if you don't. And Again, some of the uh, organizations that are going to thrive are those ones that put the human back in the center of things. And I think associations are set up to be extremely successful uh, because you know, they're, they're driven uh, to find that significance for everyone. And that's all about the human touch. Certainly, technology helps with that mission. Uh, but I think as associations, you know, we're all striving for, uh, for that significance. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sherry now because I think I went a little too, too much. So as, as Kevin's mentioned, we've heard today, um, you know, the, the good thing for associations is we have a core set of products, services, um, and a lot of data, right? So I think we're in this stage of, this is great, now what do we, how do we expand upon that? Um, so when Kevin mentioned, you know, we're looking at what is the next evolution of associations, and we've, we're calling it Association 4.0. Um, and so when we look, about, look at Association 4.0, we see big opportunities um, to make a huge impact if we can simply figure out how to integrate all the things that we do great, um, integrate our systems, um, and about connecting our systems and services to people and devices. So again, we've heard a lot of that today, and I know for some of you execs that are in the room, um, that has always been a challenge in the past. Um, and in part of you know, what we're doing today, we feel that it's very important to bring these solution providers and association execs together to say, OK, how do we create this association 4.0? How do we service our members? How do we keep them happy and engaged when that next generation is using, my daughter thought the virtual glass was like the coolest thing ever. Um, and, you know, and just with my experience, and I, I do have a 10-year-old and a 15-year-old, they do not watch television rarely. They're on YouTube. They have a totally different experience than we've had. So, you know, so part of it is looking at what is changing and how do we react to that and, and continue to, um, uh, to develop our organizations. So, um, you know, Kevin and I have been serving the association industry and Sharon as well for well over 25 years. We started, um, I've worked with the neurosurgeons where we started the first association website when I had no clue what a website was in, in 94. Then, you know, we went through the Y2K where we thought nothing was going to work on January 1st, 2000, and Tom's back there happy that I was working for him, and it actually things stayed working, which we were good. Um, and, you know, we've lived through a lot of transition, and the good thing is, as technology has advanced, we've had an opportunity to catch up because our members said, don't worry, you don't have to be Amazon. It's fine. We don't expect you to be Amazon. But now that technology is catching up, now we're expected to be Amazon. They're frustrated. I will say just for this conference alone, and many of you know this, we sent out an email and said, just respond yes. You don't have to register. You don't have to do anything. Just respond yes. Because we knew just the logging into the website, figuring out where to log in was a barrier to coming to this conference. So. We wanted to make sure that there wasn't a barrier, um, and hope those are things that you know even ourselves are trying to figure out. What is that experience going to be, and what is going to get people um, to your conferences and, and the ease of use? I know that none of you want to hear that because you probably don't want to do that manual uh, entry, but it actually didn't take that long, so it was better than taking the call <laughs> um, in, in reality because it only took me like two seconds. Um, but what we're seeing now is that the change in technology is happen so, happening so rapidly that um, 
we're going to have to be more agile as organizations. We're going to have to move quicker. Um, and that is something that we're, with this platform, we're really trying to help organizations figure that out um, and figure out how they move and how they work with, um, with their suppliers, et cetera, to get there. So as Kevin said, we started this think tank, and we've got John Forbes and Tom Conway back there and Kim and some others that are, some of them that are wearing the .org community pin. Um, and as Kevin people from all five generations in the workplace and a well range of people who have been involved in operations, publishing, IT, um, CEOs, to really get a range of what is that all these all the organizations dealing with um, and start having this think tank around, you know, where do we kind of go from here? So over the next year, we're going to be conducting these think tanks. We've already done a survey as well, um, a technology survey that actually we're not presenting here today, but we are presenting at WSAE on Monday, or Kevin is. Um, you guys and, can come up to that. Yes, yeah, so you guys can come up to that. You can see Michelle. I'm sure she'd get you registered. She's right over there in the black and white. Um, <laughs> so their Innovation Summit. But there's a lot of data that we're producing that we're going to be sharing with, with the association industry. Um, but one of the things that came out of our first think tank was, you know, what, how are we going to have to change the, the way that we serve? And as a lot of people mentioned today, um, Alex, Sandy, Tom, you know, what is that tailored experience? What is the personalization experience that we need to provide to our members? Um, we all know that digit digitization will continue, <laughs> sorry, that was bad. Um, and that we're going to have to look at integrating everything. So whether that's, um, you know, we've even been talking like instead of doing an online registration, should we be doing that via text? You know, what does that look like? Um, and we're, we're also trying to do some things ourselves to see what's working, what's not, to share that back with the think tank and say, you know, people are doing things differently, whether it's they're too busy or they're on their phones or what does that experience look like and what are people going to expect from us? Um, we really feel the group felt that customer service and the customer experience will start to blur. Um, and how we respond to our customers is going to be um, very important. Um, one of the other th examples I can give you is something that we've been talking about is I know a lot of people in this room who I can get in touch with on Facebook on LinkedIn, on email, on text, um, it just it, everybody's working a little bit differently. So how do we provide that high level of customer service broadly in an organization? For us, you know, we're a small group, so I know that if I want to get a hold of Jennifer Mahalik, I'll text her. If I want to get a hold of Tom, I'll email Tom or I'll call him. If I want to get a hold of Jim Pavletic, I'll try to find him on uh, Facebook Messenger. So. I know that personally, so how do we think about how we serve our members in the same kind of personalized way? Um, so really it's about thinking, you know, thinking a little bit differently. How do we respond to this diverse global customer base? Um, again, we personally just changed our membership model because we have a whole bunch of people in DC. Now, it's not global, but they're starting to want to get involved in an organization. We're not there yet, so we said, OK, maybe we need to have a virtual membership until we're able to take these programs out to DC. Same thing globally. Like, how do we do that and how do we communicate worldwide now um, is going to be really important. Um, and as it's been brought up, how do we cultivate staff? And how do we work with staff to be innovative and agile and think differently and take risks? Um, you know, obviously, our governance structures aren't set up to do that. <laughs> um, and that's been a challenge. So how can you be agile when we have to go three times to the board to get a website design approved or those types of things? We're not able to move quickly enough because of those governance structures. And how is that going to look for our new association model? So some questions to ask is, you know, Will the traditional sort, uh, sources of revenue for associations exist in the future? You know, how can we, uh, how can associations monetize relationships and engagement with non-traditional audiences? All of our customers are asking, can we monetize our data? And what does that 
look like? What can we do? What can we use? Um, and then, again, what type of interactions do we need to be having with our members, customers, um, and have an intimate understanding of, especially the organizations that are, as Sharon mentioned this morning, you know, there's the leadership has certain expectations, and then I always say the rank and file are people that aren't as engaged or maybe just trying to make payroll for their, org you know, for their companies are needing different things. So how do we create that personalized um, experience for for our members. So think big. Um, <laughs> so start thinking big. Um, and I say in order to do this, I really feel strongly that you need to create a digital culture. Um, and so in order to do that, that's again, I think it's hard for our traditional organizations to do that. So how can we do that? Um, one of the suggestions is create small teams. So create small teams and experience, test, and move fast. Um, without disrupting the organization. So in small teams, if you have a small team that fails, you can quickly move them into something else or another project. And again, I'll give an example. Both at the neurosurgeons and when I started the for-profit subsidiary at Derms, it, those were both times that those execs had no idea what a website was. They had no idea how to start a for-profit subsidiary, do website development for associations. But we had leaders in the organization, both on the board and the staff level, and again, Tom's back there and can attest to this, has said, Sherry, go figure it out, make it happen, and if it doesn't work, we'll get you another job. Where well, you're not gonna find a lot of people that are gonna take that kind of risk, not everybody in the room, but there are some people that will say, hey, that's, you know, that'll be me, I'll do that, and let's see if this will work out, and hopefully, keep your word and I'll have a job <laughs> if I fail, but, you know, those are things I think the associations need to think about um, and just kind of some examples, it, it can happen, and at both places we had really small teams, so it wasn't a huge investment. Um, and I do think that transparency is gonna be really important. So again, looking at our governance structures and with the staff, um, ideas can come from anywhere. Um, with this presentation, I was asking my kids, who are the YouTubers, who's this? I mean, they have no idea what I'm talking about, but they had ideas and thoughts, and you know, this top-down management and associations makes it hard to be agile and um, be innovative because of that structure. So think about where the ideas are coming from. My two examples is, I always say, I was a kid. I was young and dumb, so I could take risks. Like, I was like, okay, well, I don't have, you know, kids or a mortgage or whatever, so, you know, we'll do a website. Let's see what happens. Um, so those are the types of things I think, it's just some thought-provoking things to think about how we move our organizations forward, and how you leave an event like today and say, hey, let's try this small thing with this small group, and let's see if we can make that work. Um, and of course, always thinking digital first. Um, as it was brought up this, this morning, um, I believe it was, you know, Alex said, you know, looking at, we're all using our phones. Most of you today, in the past, probably everybody would have their laptop open. A lot of people are using their phones. They're looking at it you know, their emails, whatever. So what does that communication need to look like? How does it change the way that we work? And I really think that that's gonna move into text and some other uh, formats uh, um, as well. Um, so, you know, um, again, I think it always goes back to look at consumer behavior, look in your industry of what's being disruptive and how we can um, move our organizations to succeed. So with that, uh, so, no, there's more to come. As I said, we're going to have another Think Tank session in November. Um, and uh, we, we plan to have an Association 4.0 Summit um, in April of 2017. So for those of you that are in the room that are involved in Think Tank, we've got a lot of work to do. Um, but we want to talk about then kind of our findings of through um, the research that we're doing, through these Think Tanks, through information we're getting back from organizations, you know, what how can we move our organizations forward? What can these new structures look like? Um, and how can we um, succeed? So if stay tuned, um, and if you're in the community, we will also be putting things out in the .org community website. Um, we do have our technology survey there, but those of you that aren't in the community, if you want that, we are happy to share it with you. Just let Kevin or I know. Um, we can get that to you. And I think that that's all I've got for but right now.